Um, so let's just say, say I cut out the first few minutes and let's say the recording starts here. Hello, um, doing a live stream slash recording, whatever, of uh, talking about JFractalizer, which is a program that I um, wrote some 10 years ago. So if we look at the older commits, they mostly date from 2013, February 2013, um, 2012, um, beginning of Git development, yeah. So September 2012 um, is when the GitHub history of this started, but actually um, um, there is some older history that just didn't make it into Git because I didn't know Git yet. Um, let's uh, look, let's start by looking at the readme maybe. So the JFractalizer is a fractal explorer written in Java. Inspiration and the idea for the name uh, comes from the freeware Fractalizer. Uh, and the long time goal is to include all of its features. That's not really true anymore, but the Fractalizer was a thing back then. If you go to this link now, you will just find a dead page, a park domain, whatever. Uh, but it is fortunately available in the Wayback Machine. So this is what the website looked like back in the day. This was the Fractalizer, um, mainly German software, but had an English website as well. Um, and the Internet Archive thankfully has, where is it actually? Here, I think. Um, yeah, you can download an exe file and it actually works. So let's just try that with vine tim fractalizer fractalizer.exe. And hopefully you can see all that launched on the second screen. There we go. Uh, let's just recalculate that again so you can see roughly how fast this is. So it starts out with a Mandelbrot set. Uh, you can save a picture if you want, control P, it's like printing. You can save and load your settings in some uh, weird format. And you zoom in by dragging the mouse. Uh, yeah, Comic Sans is very funny. <laughs> um, be happy that my system has Comic Sans installed, by the way. <laughs> uh, so you drag your mouse over an area and then makes, it makes a rectangle with um, where it's uh, inverted. And then if you release the mouse, um, right, I forgot that it does that. It opens a window where you can change the settings and then uh, you zoom in. You do that a few times. And you've seen areas of the Mandel Road set that nobody's ever seen before. And at this point, you need to probably increase the depth a little bit. Uh, where is that actually? The thing is, I haven't used this thing in ages. Uh, is it size? Yeah, no, that's the picture size. Is it formula? No, uh, that is not it either. Uh, reset all values, no. Area, that's the one, area. So instead of a max depth of 900, let's say 5,000. And that makes it a bit slower to calculate, but then you can see these shapes much better. Uh, so that's uh, what I just used to play around with. Um, I like this software and I wanted to make um, something similar, I guess, or I wanted some features in there. I don't remember what the exact motivation was where I thought I'll just make something like that myself. Um, but that's what I did. So um, I called it the J Fractalizer for Java, obviously. Um, and I made it actually open source instead of just freeware like this one, where as far as I'm aware, um, their source code, source code for this was never released. Um, yeah, but one thing you could do with this actually was to not only save a picture, you could also make a video where it would just, uh, from the area that you have, it would slowly zoom out um, and take a picture each time. And then you could uh, reverse all those images and make a film out of it where you zoom into the fractal. And that was really cool. And I used to just waste hours and hours of CPU time on my shitty little laptop back then uh, making those films. And nowadays it goes much faster. Um, so that's one thing this thing supported, which I eventually added to the JFractalizer as well. Um, it has a context menu. You can zoom out. You can center the fractal at a certain point. Let's center it here. Um, and you can customize the color palette. Um, there are several default options. Um, I think the multicolored one was really nice, actually. Uh, so you just select a bunch of colors here and which how many steps are between each of them. And then you draw it uh, like this, compute a new. 
Okay, this actually looks really shitty right now. Uh, how is the rainbow computer new? Nah, no, it's not really that great. Uh, you need the pallet size. Let's try to increase it by a factor of 10. Does that work? That's better. Um, so that's the fractalizer. I think I've talked about it enough. Um, and then the J fractalizer is the copy I built of this in Java. And the first four releases, so there was a version 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, and I just made those without any kind of source control because I had no idea what I was doing. And then eventually I heard about this thing called Git uh, that I should be using. Actually, at the time I still remember Googling if I should use Git or SVN. And in 2012, this was apparently not quite settled yet. I'm glad I went with Git um, because nowadays SVN is definitely basically dead or you wouldn't want to use it. Um, but this was a question that I faced then. And fortunately I went with Git. Um, so you only have the history starting from version 0 0.5 and then I worked on it through 2012 um, and a bit of, uh, we saw this earlier, 2013 as well, uh, March 2013 and then, uh, where is it? Okay, this is still 2013 and then this is the first page. I kind of stopped working on it in May 2013. Yeah, and then in October I did something apparently. And then left it alone. I oh, did something in December 2013. Added a license file in May 2015. Oh, okay, so I didn't make it free software. I just made it source available, I guess, at the time. I didn't realize that. Um, okay. Um, but then since 2015, I basically didn't touch it again for years and years. So it's kind of like a time capsule of um, code development practices that seemed like a good idea to me at the time. And all of this uh, readme is very, very, very outdated. But let's take a look at it. So, um, oops, J fractalize, there we go. You can clone it from GitHub and there is now a script in it called compile that you run and it doesn't take too long. And it's a very simple script, it just compiles everything in the directory core and in the directory default plugin, and we'll talk about those in a second, I think. And then there's another script called run, which is just add those two directories where we added the um, binary files to the class path, um, and then run the core class with all the remaining arguments. So let's run that, and the window gets put on the wrong screen, unfortunately, but you can choose a fractal. There's two available, Mandelbrot set and Julia set. And you can choose a color palette. There's four implementations at the moment, simple, node, HSB rotating, and HSB stretching. Um, let's start with the node one for now. And then, unfortunately, it was on the wrong screen again, but that's what the J-Fractalizer looks like. And the node palette, if you edit it, it looks kind of, it works kind of similar to what we saw in the J-Fractalizer. So you can configure the number of nodes there and then add, uh, set the color of each pair of nodes, that's it like this, and it will interpolate between those, if I remember correctly. So it will take 16 steps to interpolate between red and yellow, then 60 more between yellow and green, and so on. And the core is black, and then we can calculate that and see it. And if we zoom in, we see those colors being used there, which is kind of nice. Um, but here we definitely need to um, increase the additional parameters. We need to increase the depth again. I should probably talk about what that means in a second, but let's just bump it to 5,000 for now. Um, I think a bit more actually. Um, control uh, A, right, additional parameters. Let's make it 10,000. Uh, still doesn't look too great, to be honest. Let's edit the color palette and bump all of these to 64 so that the color transitions are smoother. Actually, that could still be a lot better. Um, but uh, that's fine for now, I think. Uh, yeah, and then in it you can choose a different color palette because eventually I got bored of um, having to define all these nodes in here. And so I went 
with the uh, HSB rotating one, which is a weird name. Uh, basically, HSB is the hue saturation brightness color space, I think, or color model. Um, and it rotates through the hue. So what it does, it, it's just a rainbow. And you can edit it and say, how many steps are there on the rainbow? Let's say 1024. You can configure the brightness and saturation if you want. I basically always leave it at um, one. And you can uh, change where the hue starts on the color wheel. Um, I think we can actually change it a bit more. Edit color palette. Let's take 496. Yeah, this is kind of nice. See, when, if we zoom in here now, and then, yeah, this is kind of nice. Uh, so there you have the rainbow, and you can configure how fast it goes. If I take this to 65536, so 2 third power 16, then it's basically just a sea of red with little specks in there. If I make it 512, then it's not going to look... Mm, it's not the worst, okay. It's okay, actually, kind of. Very psychedelic, but not as terrible as I thought. Um, and one thing you can definitely do to just make this look nicer is another idea I stole from the J-Fractalizer, which was in the additional parameters, you can change the super sampling factor. And this just means that instead of calculating one uh, coordinate per pixel, we calculate a two by two square or by th three by three square per pixel and then average the color. And then this way, everything gets much more smoothed out because you don't get random variations because you happen to have picked the wrong coordinate for this pixel. Um, it's fairly similar to just you calculate the whole image at the higher resolution and then you scale it down again, um, except implement it internally that you don't have to uh, make the window huge. Um, and this goes in theory as high as you want, which is kind of silly. I think a factor higher than three, you're rarely going to see a difference. Let's see if we even see. Okay, a two definitely still makes a difference uh, from three. So one is the worst one. That's pretty noisy visually. Though I'm not sure how much of that will come across on the stream, I guess. Uh, but with two, it already gets kind of smoothed out. And with three by three, it gets a lot smoothed out. The difference is um, the calculation also takes a lot longer. It takes uh, nine times longer, it should take, than the one by one calculation. If we put it all the way up to five, we I think that is basically indistinguishable from three by three, to be honest. Um, nah. Now maybe there's a little difference, but not much. I think three by three is already pretty good. Um, and if you like what you've done, you can uh, save the image. Um, Control P is if you're printing it, and the formats that I decided to support at the time were JPEG, PNG, and GIF, which is, I, I mean, especially choosing JPEG as the default is just wild. Um, just use PNG, use PNG all the time. There's no reason to use either of the other two formats, to be honest. And also you can save the setup, uh, so all the uh, coordinates, whatever, um, as, um, let's call this one whatever dot, or it's called whatever, and then we can look at the file, whatever. It's actually saved it as fract XML, which is just a random flavor of XML that I made up. And I'm pretty sure the only reason for that is that I had never heard of JSON, um, because you could just as well make this JSON. But uh, so this saves the coordinates, um, the maximum passes that we configured, the super sampling factor, the width and height of the image in pixels. And also for the color palette, it saves the name, uh, the class name in Java, uh, where the hue starts, what the factor is, saturation, brightness, and the core color. Um, yeah, and then you can load this uh, later, and it should all still work. Um, and yeah, I should probably make PNG the default. Um, so what's a good next thing to talk about? Uh, there's several things I want to talk about. I have no idea in which order. Um, I think one thing 
I can maybe talk about is this thing about in the source code, you see there's these two directories, jfractalize core and jfractalize default plugin. And for some bizarre reason, I decided to put spaces in those directory names, which is really, really annoying actually. Um, but architecturally, what you have there is that I decided to make um, this to make a plugin infrastructure for this program based on some standard Java thing where you can uh, tell Java, give me all the implementations of this interface that are available in the class path. And then I present all of those to the user or something like that. Um, so the core is um, the user interface basically and has um, doesn't really know that much about what fractals are or what color palettes are. Um, it just defines those interfaces and then in the default plugins is the code for those fractals and for the color palettes. And if you loaded a different plugin, in theory, you could have a different choice of color palettes. Uh, so all of these are actually in the default plugin and not in the core. And likewise for the fractal, Mandelbrot set, Julia set, both of those are in the default plugin. And you could make your own plugin I don't think anybody's ever done that, um, but that's why the source code is arranged this way. Uh, can I not just remove the spaces? I can, but um, I mentioned it before, to me this is kind of like a time capsule, this program, and I'm happy to just leave a lot of the things as they are. Yeah, you should be able to lo load multiple plugins, and the um, dialog should just show you everything that's available, so you would just need to add it. Um, to the class path when you run Java. So um, that's why the compiling is run in two steps. So it compiles the core by itself, um, just compile into the bin directory all the Java files, and then in the default plugin, compile with the core in the class path, compile that. And you should be able to make another one. My headset turned itself off. And if you look at the jfractalizer default plugin in source meta inf, there's right exactly there's four kinds of services that are defined in there. Let's look at fractal for example. There's um, it lists that there's the Mandelbrot road set fractal and the Julia set fractal. And apparently I didn't put a line break at the end of those files, which is um, really annoying. Um, and color palette there's four different color palettes available and um, yeah you should just be able to add another um, either jar file or directory to the class path and then um, make sure to include the meta in file and then it should be able to load everything um, yeah and then if you look at the source code, let's look at the default plugin in source. Wait, there's a license txt there. Oh, okay. So the initial git commit did have a license txt file, just not at the root of the repository. Okay, then that's fine. Um, so in default plugin source, the e-lookers-argmeister jfractalize default plugin, there's the cameras, sif, and the palettes. And also the default plugin with Java, what does this do? Oh, it registers a bunch of stuff, okay. Right, it is a lot of ridiculous stuff there. I don't even know what this logging thing was. Um, but in the palettes, there is the um, HSB rotate palette.java, for instance, um, where you get the color for a number of passes, and then it calculates the color out of that and also saves fract XML and loads it. Um, and SIF is um, a name that I made up. And I think that's a good idea. Um, we can talk about this now. So SIF is supposed to stand for complex iterative fractal and it's supposed to describe, um, because I, I, th I think I searched and I couldn't find a collective name for the Julia set and the Mandelbrot set. And let's just talk a little bit about how those work anyway. So uh, Mandelbrot set, to calculate this image, um, you convert the point you have into a complex number. So you have the real axis there uh, horizontally and the imaginary axis there vertically. And you... Um, 
to calculate the color of a certain pixel, you take the complex coordinates of that pixel. Um, and usually this is going to be somewhere between minus two and two on the real axis and minus one and one on the imaginary axis, if I remember correctly. So fairly small numbers. And then you plug that um, number C into this formula. Um, so you start with z equals zero, you square that, you add c to it, and then you square that and add c to it, and you square that and add c to it, and so on and so on. And you always start with zero and c is the number that you're calculating. Um, and then either at some point uh, this series escapes to infinity, um, which means it's not part of the Mandelbrot set as a mathematical object itself, but you assign it a color based on how many iterations it took before it escaped out into infinity, or um, you reach a maximum set of iterations, and that's the number of passes that we saw here. So if you've done this uh, repetition uh, 12,750 times in this case, and you still haven't escaped into infinity, then you say this point is part of the Mandelbrot set, and you assign it the color, um, the core color, which usually is black. So if we uh, if we start this again from the beginning, uh, actually no, let's use ah, uh, damn it, okay. Let's use the Mandelbrot set and use the HSB rotating palette. And let's actually zoom out a little bit on center by 100%. There we go. So you decide if it's escaped to infinity by seeing if it's within a radius of two, I believe, or outside of a radius of two of the coordinate zero, zero. And the coordinate zero, zero is right here. And that's why, oops, we didn't zoom out properly, zoom out on center 100%. So in this circle around 0, 0, uh, you can see um, that is where it's assigned the first color. So all of these values outside of this circle, they have escaped to infinity after no iterations. Uh, uh, so they get the color either 0 or 1, I don't remember. And then everything inside this orange area uh, is going to escape outside of this circle in one iteration, so it gets the next color. And then everything in yellow escapes after two iterations and it gets the next color and so on. And you can see these shells kind of coming closer and closer to the shape of the black set in the middle, which is the points that never escape. Um, and as you zoom in, the difference between individual iterations uh, grows smaller and smaller. So by the point we get in here, for example, you can see the super noisy area in the middle where um, a tiny variation in the starting point might mean it escapes in uh, 500 iterations or in 501 iterations or in 502 iterations. And so you have basically adjacent pixels getting completely different colors, uh, which doesn't look very nice. So that's the point where you start increasing uh, the number of steps. So instead of saying after, uh, so instead of saying with each additional iteration um, in this formula, we add 1 16th um, to the hue. Uh, let's add instead 1 512 to the hue so that it only repeats after 512 iterations and gets the same color again. And then all of these different pixels here that have a similar but not quite identical um, number of iterations, they get now get a very similar color. And you can um, turn this even higher um, and decide what the nature of the image is in that case. And the black parts are always going to be the same. So these are the parts of the uh, Mandelbrot set that the points that actually never escape to infinity. Um, and a lot of them look like a tiny copy of the original set. Sometimes they're fairly symmetrical. Sometimes they're also distorted. I think we can see one here. Uh, not really, actually. This one is still fairly symmetrical. Um, but sometimes they're just um, really skewed and asymmetrical, which can look r really funny. And of course, if with this color palette setting you go back to the initial um, 
image, then you're not um, really going to see any difference between the iterations one, two, and three, as we saw before, because now we've configured the color palette differently. Um, and the thing with the Julia set is that it is calculated very similarly. I would have to look up how uh, set, please. Uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, right. So I think, if I remember correctly, with the Julia set, you use this same kind of formula, uh, but uh, Z uh, doesn't start at zero. Z starts at the coordinate in the image where you're at. And then for each value of C, you get a different Julia set. So um, I can, let's restart the program to get the default settings again. Blup, blup. And I can say I would like for this point here, the according Julia set. So that's where we set C to this point in the complex plane. And it looks like this. Or I can go to the mantle road set again and instead, oops. Um, okay, there we go, bug. Um, I can go to this point here in the mantle road set, switch to the according Julia set and it looks like this. Um, oh, there's an arrow in the background, nice. Okay, cool. Um, and essentially for if I remember correctly, for the points outside the Mandel Road set, um, so the ones that are colored, the Julia set is connected and... No, okay, apparently not. Um, if we pick a point inside... Okay, for the points inside the Julia set... Uh, no, for the points inside the Mandel Road set, the Julia set is connected, it's a blob like this. Um, for the points outside the Mandel Road set, the Julia set is disconnected. Uh, but you get the most interesting Julia set if you pick a point in the Mandel Road set that is um, just at the edge of the Mandel Road set. So it's just barely either inside or not inside. So if I switch to Julia set here, then it looks like this, um, which actually isn't that nice. Let's pick a different one. Um, Let's pick one from here. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try again. There we go. And if I choose a color palette that's nicer, let's pick the HSP rotating one again, but with a period of, I don't know, 128. That's pretty nice. And then you can zoom in there just like with the Mandel Road set and get beautiful structures as well. Um, we need to turn this a bit higher. Oops, uh, but not that high. I meant just one. Uh, yeah, 1024. And then you can zoom in and see just infinite structures. Um, personally, I find the Mandel Road set more interesting. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that the Julia set and the Mandel Road set are calculated very similarly, at least with the fairly naive implementation that I went with. And so I wanted to share some code between them, which meant I had to pick a name for uh, what you call um, this kind of fractal, and I couldn't find a collective term. Maybe there is one and I just missed it, but I went for CIF, a complex iterative fractal, and that's what where that in the code comes from. So if you uh, go there, actually, that's, let's just start Eclipse um, and look at the code there. Um, then you will be able to see uh, in the default plugin, SIF, there's the Julia set, which extends a SIF fractal, and SIF fractal defines a bunch of common things, like um, every SIF fractal has a imaginary minimum, maximum, and real minimum, maximum. It has a color palette. It has a super sampling factor. It has whatever. Um, so all of this code gets shared between them. Um, I think we can close all of this, actually. Uh, yeah, the Julia set is definitely more symmetrical and has some nice properties as well. Um, so if we pick the, if we increase the super sampling factor there, uh, we should get some nicer looking image. Yeah, that's pretty nice, isn't it? 
Um, right, I think I remember now one of my main motivations for writing J fractalizer over fractalizer. So if we just zoom in a bit more, uh, you can see that it actually calculates the image in a bunch of smaller rectangular areas. If I recalculate it, you can see it again. And here they all roughly take the same time, but actually, um, so this is parallelizing across however many cores I have on this um, system. What is it? Uh, 24. So I think 12 real physical cores and each of them has hyperthreading. Uh, so when I wrote this, I was on a laptop that had a dual core CPU with hyperthreading, so four virtual CPUs. Um, and the fractalizer, the Windows program that I started with, didn't uh, make use of them. So one CPU was always idle. And I didn't like that. And I think that was one of the motivations, if I remember correctly, of um, writing the J fractalizer that I could make it parallelize. And I made it parallelize so well that it even works on the CPU, which is more powerful than I could have possibly dreamed of. Um, so it splits the image just into those rectangular areas, and each CPU gets to, gets busy and starts working. And one thing I did uh, that I want to talk about on the Mandelbrot set... Um, let's reset the color parallel for a second, and let's just zoom in a little bit until we find something... Let's just go to random areas. There we go, there's a little Mandelbrot set. Let's go to the vicinity of that. Um, let's edit the color palette and bump this up to, I don't know, 4096 might be... That's pretty decent. And we definitely also need to increase the depth to at least 25,000, I would say. More. More, actually. Um, 50,000? Because those should definitely be, no, those bulbs should be proper circles. Um, so let's change that to 100,000 iterations. There we go, that looks better. And if I now zoom in to one of those, um, actually make the color parallel even wider, like this maybe, ah, one more. So that's going to be one, six, two, eight, four, if I'm doing the maths right. I mean, there's no reason it has to be a power of two. I'm just um, sticking to that. Actually, let's make it... Um, there we go. That looks fairly nice. And let's bump the depth again to, let's say, 200,000. Let's be really generous. And what you can see there is that the calculation doesn't just go top down in a line. It kind of wriggles around, and that's because of one optimization that I built, which I was pretty happy with. I'm I think I'm still pretty happy with it, which is that there's not just one Mandelbrot image maker, there's actually two of them. Uh, one is called Calc All, and the other one is called No Holes. And this one, oh, let's close the code and just talk about it. So this one exploits the property that um, the Mandelbrot set is connected, actually. So all of those little tiny satellites you see, they are in theory, uh, where's an image of them? They're in theory all connected to the original. This one, for instance, has somewhere an infinitely thin line connecting it to the original one, because all the black parts, all the actual parts of the set, are connected with each other. Um, but you can't really see that because the line is so infinitely thin, and each time you zoom in, it just gets surrounded by more pixels that take uh, more iterations but aren't actually part of the set, and so on. But more importantly, the set is also full, um, I'm not sure if it actually says it on their article here, but I think full is the right term. Um, and what that means is that the inverse of the thing is also connected. So you don't have any holes inside of a black area where suddenly you would have a few pixels that need to be colored in again. Which means in an image like this, you can save yourself a huge amount of work but by saying that something like um, this rectangle here. Uh, let's say you've calculated a line of black pixels here, a line of black pixels here, a line of black pixels here, and a line of black pixels going back up. You have a complete rectangle rectangle where the whole um, border area is um, 
is all black pixels. It's all part of the metal road set. And that means we now know that all the inside of that rectangle must be black pixels as well. And we can save ourselves the trouble of calculating uh, 200,000 iterations of this uh, iterative formula here for every one of those pixels. We don't need to do that. We know that they all need to be in the metal road set. And so that's the optimization that is implemented by this image maker exploiting the property that it has no holes. So there's some uh, weird extra metadata here where it tracks uh, the pixel has no colored pixels and then we know which one of the adjacent pixels do we even need to calculate or which one do we not need to calculate. And that's where you get these weird shapes from. Um, because let's get even further in and see if we can yeah, you can really start to see it there, how it, um, let's zoom in on this bulb, how it eventually covers everything, um, but takes longer and longer um, to calculate everything. But in this whole left area, it's actually been done pretty quickly, and it's the right area which takes longer. Um, because on the left area, it just needed to calculate the outline of the little rectangle that this thread was assigned and see, okay, this whole rectangle is black. We can stop doing any further work. Um, could there not be an infinitely thin line connecting them? Not as far as I know. I mean, maybe in theory, but in practice, I just don't think it looks like that. And I think you can sometimes get, if the calculation depth isn't deep enough and... Uh, so in this image, maybe there might be some false positives of pixels that should be cal colored in, but um, we didn't increase the depth enough to see that. So let's put that to 500,000. Um, oh, okay. And now we can see this is actually a tiny Mandelbrot set again. Oh yeah. And you could... The headset did stupid things again. Um... And here the depth is still not high enough, actually. But in general, I think this method works, works really well and it speeds up the calculation a lot. Um, but to make this look nice, we would definitely need to increase this even further. I think maybe 2 times 18 uh, to the power of is what I mean. 262144. That might look decent. Yeah, that's pretty nice. And then ideally, uh, you would need to increase the super sampling factor uh, as well to make it look nicer. Um, yeah. If and let's do that. Edit additional parameters. Let's put that up to uh, two, not three, but two might look nice. Yeah, that looks already. A lot better I think although we still actually need to improve that and here you can actually see so this is doesn't look like the mini Mandelbrot set yet but now it does so it was finishing calculating this area of this rectangle first and then it went back to some pixels up there that it knew hadn't finished yet and that um, needed to be filled in and then it works um, oh, fuck, let's go to 1 million um, and see that effect even more closely. So here it has a first approximation of this mini Mandelbrot set and then you can see the rows just going through and then eventually it's going to come back there and finish that. There we go and now it looks like a mini Mandelbrot set again. And oh yeah it has a nice spiral on the right as well. I'm pretty sure by the way we're definitely the first humans to have ever seen this exact area of the Mandelbrot set. It's such a tiny, tiny area. So three, six, one, one, two, one, three, five, seven, seven, three, seven, four. That's how many digits uh, after the comma uh, the coordinates finally um, are different. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny area of the complex plane that we are zoomed in on. Um, yeah, so Good job, we are the first ever humans to see this particular thing. <laughs> um, and actually, if we're right next to the Mandelbrot set here, we can go to the corresponding 
Julia set and see if that looks interesting. Okay, we need to change the color palette to be uh, way less detailed again. Okay, not quite that detailed. So let's make it 256 maybe. That's fairly nice. Yeah, that's a nice little spiral, isn't it? I think 512 maybe. Yeah, we can zoom in in the central area where we see this. Let's center on the mouse location. We definitely need to bump the depth a little bit again. Oh, no, that is not what I meant. Uh, there we go. Okay, no, it needs to be more. 10,000. Um, and we need to edit the color palette, maybe 248. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Um, and then we could zoom into this spiral, which apparently has tiny Julia sets around it again. Um, and we need to increase the depth to, let's just go to 100,000 right away. There we are. Um, we need to bump this a little bit again. Yeah, that looks fairly nice. We can eyeball the middle of that is roughly here. So let's center on that location. Let's um, bump the super sampling up to three by three. Yeah, that looks nice, doesn't it? So that's a tiny part of one random Julia set. Looks like a Chinese dragon, that's nice. Um, yeah, so maybe I can talk a little bit about some of the weirder things that I did here. Uh, one of them is um, the keyboard shortcuts are not exactly intuitive. So a save setup, load setup, so that's save open, that's fine. Save image, control P for print, that's just taken from the uh, real fractalizer, that's fine. And then I made the decision which is really weird to have all the keyboard shortcuts in the fractal menu as just control and everything on the color palette as control shift. And so that starts with C, uh, where control C stands for choose the fractal instead of copy like in every other application on the planet. Um, so you choose the fractal with C and the palette with shift C, and then there's edit the fractal with control E or edit the color palette with control shift E. And it just, I've been using JFractalizer a bit again over the past few days and weeks, and it just does not feel natural. It still doesn't. It's a weird choice that I made. But I don't really want to change it now because I'm not really working on this actively anymore. I'm mainly happy with just leaving this code as it was. Um, and then that's actually the only two entries in the color palette menu. Um, and here there's, there's a undo redo, which mostly works, not quite. Um, in the Julia set, you can change the start value, uh, so which part of the Mandelbrot set it corresponds to. Oh, oh, cool, the cancel button doesn't work. <laughs> well done. Is it an error? Uh, yep, yeah, it is. What happens? No such method error. What? Uh, the access method is gone. Oh, okay. So that's in Julia set .java line 96. Let's take a look at that line 96. What does this do? Um, in action performed, yes. No such method error access. What? Where's an access method? I don't know what's wrong here. Is it something like... Wait, what is closing? Oh, there is. It's a private boolean of the action listener. But in here I'm inside another action. So I'm trying to access the outer variable. Is this something that's not allowed in Java anymore? I don't know. There's definitely a lot of... A lot of this code would probably be written better. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, well, that's what I was talking about. But let's hope that OK works. Nope, it doesn't. We are. <laughs> we're stuck. Uh, not good. If I press Enter, does that work? Nope. OK. Too bad. <laughs> OK. Um, let's go with this again. Uh, another really weird thing that I did was the command line interface. And for that, I really just need to go to the wiki page on the JFractalizer wiki. Um, 
also I decided to write this those wiki pages in a media wiki syntax, I think, and ran into a bug and I thought anyone would care, which was bizarre. Just use markdown. Just don't expect uh, GitHub to support media wiki syntax. Wiki text is a terrible object, uh, terrible syntax. Never mind. So um, you can't change variables defined outside of closure of nodes in a class. Is that a change or was this code always broken and I just didn't realize it? I wouldn't rule that out. Um, but yeah, I guess I need to find some other solution for that. Uh, so the command line interface is um, weird. Let's just look at some examples. Uh, so for instance, you have jfractalizer, minus minus core, no GUI true, minus minus input is uh, some fract XML. Um, in minus minus film, you set the camera and you set the camera arguments and the output file um, to standard out in this case. And so it was always like this. Okay, atomic boolean or whatever. Maybe I'll look into that later. So clearly with this minus minus stuff, I must have seen some um, program with GNU style uh, long options like minus minus help, minus minus version, whatever. But I very clearly did not understand how they worked or for some reason I decided to do my completely own thing. Um, so I invented this um, command line concept of you have uh, realms where with two dashes you specify what realm you're currently in and then inside each realm you can set these options without any dashes and the option name is specific to the current realm. Um, so inside the core realm, you can set no GUI or you can set debug. Inside the input realm, you can say that the input should be a file or it should be standard input or there should be a fractal or a color palette that you uh, define uh, to override what you have in the file or whatever. And then in the output, you can specify there's a bunch of files or standard out or whatever. It's just incredibly weird what I did there. And what I have to do if I want to make a film now. Uh, so I didn't integrate. So there is support in JFractalizer for making a film that zooms into the fractal automatically. Um, but I didn't integrate into the user face. So what you have to do is use the command line for that. And what I just do is um, copy this whole thing and then adjust the file name or whatever. And then I'm happy with that. Um, and I try not to understand whatever I did there 10 years ago, which makes no damn sense, which is just so weird. Um, but again, that's not really something I want to change now. I'm happy to just leave it and maybe add a mo more example command lines. Um, yeah, and one thing I did for some reason, um, I think because I was worried about having not a lot of memory available or something, uh, was that it would actually keep zooming out um, and just write each frame as raw blue, green, red for some reason to standard output. And then you could pipe this sequence of frames directly into X264, which was the H264 encoder, I guess, um, that was available for Windows or something. You would pipe it in there and tell X264 okay, the standard input is just a raw stream of data with exactly this width and height and whatever. And then it would directly encode that into a video file and you would never write the individual frames of the film anywhere. And that's incredibly annoying because you have to get the options to X264 exactly right. And also what you end up with at the end is a film that zooms out and not in because the frame that the way that the JFractalizer film works is that it starts at wherever you specified the input file. Um, and then it zooms out and zooms out and zooms out until it's reached uh, the starting image and then it stops. Uh, so if you just pipe in, into X264, you get a film that zooms out and not one that zooms in. Um, and really what you want to be doing is to just write one image per frame. Um, and I had an example for that somewhere. Uh, it would be cam arcs there. Um, so you just say 
I want the output to be PNG files and the files should be in this directory with a, and the question mark gets replaced with the sequence number. And then you run this uh, command. And then at the end, you have a bunch of images as PNGs. And then you run something like ffmpeg minus i, um, probably this, except with percent 06d for PNG, and then out.mp4, whatever, and then ffmpeg um, collects all of those files in the right order and it does the right thing. And that's what you really want to do. So I should probably just remove this pipe example, or at least I should add an example um, that does it the way that you really want to be doing it. Um, yeah, I guess find also has weird options. Um, but it would be nicer if it was just standard options. Um, but I don't really plan to change it now. Um, yeah, as we've seen, there are some bugs in it. But yeah, overall, it's a nice program. You can zoom in. Uh, if you decide that was wrong, you can zoom out again. Control Z. You can also zoom in again. There's a redo. Control Y instead of Control Shift Z because of course Control Shift Z would be something in the color palette menu. Um, and oh, here we, here we have one that's really askew and distorted, as uh, so what I mentioned earlier. And if you've done the zoom incorrectly, then you can right click. Uh, you, I would like to center on this location. I would like to zoom in or out, either on the mouse location or on the center of the image. Um, so, so let's center there. Color palette definitely needs to be higher. Oh, that's nice. Let's maybe center on this location. Nope, a bit further down. A bit further down again, actually. A bit more. There we go. That looks pretty nice. Um, uh, maybe a bit more colors? No, no, that looks boring now. 124 was pretty good. Uh, just we need to change the calculation depth to, let's say, no, actually, well, that was pretty fine. 5,000 should be enough. Pretty much, but also what we really need is more super sampling. Let's bump that up to 3x3. Three three. And then there you go. You have a really nice image of a tiny part of the Mandelbrot set. Um, yeah, and now one final problem that I only discovered yesterday is that um, getting an image at a higher resolution is not quite as easy as it seems. So first of all, let's save this. Just make it uh, 10. Uh, today is the 22nd, uh, the first image today. So we can note that later. And if I now say I would like to change the size of the image to um, full HD, so this is how big this image, uh, this uh, monitor that we're looking at, the screen is. Um, but actually, it has slightly um, downsized the image. Um, oops, wrong window, this one. It is now not quite 1080 pixels high. And I think it might even have broken the aspect ratio here, I'm not sure. Um, so if you want to change uh, the size, I think you need to um, use the command line interface actually, or you need to be on a screen that's big enough. So if I wanted to have a full HD screenshot of this um, image, then I could just drag it onto my 4K uh, display and there it should work. But if I wanted a 4K version, then I think I would have to use the uh, command line interface. Um, so let's try that for a second. So that would be run. Um, Input file equals uh, this file, Lucas. And also, where does where do you specify the size? Is that under fract args? Uh, I think it might be. Um, does it say width here anywhere? Yeah, it's in the fract args. Okay, so we override the fact args that get load from, loaded from the file, we override part of them with width equals 1920, height equals 1080. And then we say um, the palette args, we don't care, that's all fine. But the we generate an image and the output is format equals PNG, file equals home, Lucas, 
PNG. And there's an exception because I. Does that mean this is wrong? Um, so this is in output.java line 38. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Output line 38. Yeah, the output needs to be PNG, JPEG, raw, ARGB, or raw BGR in lowercase. So actually, the wiki is wrong. Uh, format uppercase JPEG is definitely not going to work. Uh, also, this, uh, because it's not using equals ignore case, right? No. Uh, so let's just fix that. This needs to be PNG lowercase without ping, just PNG, and JPEG. Format must be lowercase. So go back to the command line. Format is PNG. And time it as well. Um, it's done. What you couldn't see there is, actually, it still renders the user interface. And I think it might even have generates an image in the wrong size now because I pulled it over into this screen. Uh, let's see. Mm, might be the right size, but let's delete it anyway and say, um, actually, we want this with core no GUI equals true. And now there's nothing to see on either screen, but after two and a half seconds, it's done, or 38 seconds of CPU time. And we can look at the image again. And now it's definitely a 1080p image, and we can full screen it. And there it is. Doesn't it look nice? Uh, wonder if you would want to slightly increase the number of steps in the color palette. I think you would want to increase the number of um, the depth, maybe a little bit. So. What is the depth here? It is 5,000. Um, let's just do that again with... Uh, with the headset turn itself off again, with max, it's called depth. Okay, not max passes. Depth equals, let's do 10,000. Uh, depth, 10,000. New file. Might take... Oh. Nope. It is called max passes. It is not called depth. <sighs> Fucking hell. I think I just changed a bunch of these command line options and then didn't um, update the wiki. Uh, super sampling is also called super sampling factor. There we go. But with height, max real, max imac, that's all fine. Uh, fix super sampling factor and max passes option names. Oh, there was actually another one. I just saw it as it saved. Uh, up here, super sampling factor and max passes. Fix super sampling factor and round two. Um, so let's go back to the command line and this needs to be max passes. Super sampling factor can stay as it is at three. Um, what? Cannot invoke set in na What? Uh, okay, let's kill that. Okay. Uh, something so in sifractal.java, uh, let's go there. Uh, lines 461. There's the set params, okay. Then line 617. If okay, if the canvas is null and the history is null, then it tries to add to history. Okay, that's... Oh, and the difference from the previous one is that the max passes is a property of the image, um, no, of the fractal, whereas the width and height is not a property of the fractal, so it wouldn't have been added to the undo redo history. That's the... Okay. Um, in this case, let's just copy this to 
uh, depth 10,000 dot fract XML depth 10,000 and make the depth 10,000 here and then run this without the max passes stuff and with depth 10,000 as the fract XML to the PNG and it's done it took 41 and a half seconds of CPU time this time instead of what was it before okay it was it was fairly similar and then we can look at uh, depth 10,000 do we see a difference between yeah definitely so this is the previous one with the depth 5,000 and then 10,000 yeah all of those circles are much more refined now so that definitely makes a difference and everything else looks just exactly identical of course Okay, so yeah, and I think that's most of what I had to say, to be honest. Um, weird program has some bugs, I might fix some of the bugs, but generally I treat this as something I worked on 10 years ago, and that's now it's still working it's still nice it still has some features that i'm missing in uh xaos for example which is the other uh big fractal explorer apparently where you just um oops wait uh did i do something wrong xaos there we go yeah clicking is supposed to zoom in so here you zoom in smoothly and you have to keep moving. Okay, you don't actually have to keep the mouse moving, but you have to click the keep holding the mouse button down, and it's fairly slow. Um, and that's how you zoom in. Um, but there's no way to center the image, for instance. If I'm not um, completely happy with where it is, I can drag it around with the middle mouse button, but I can't say I want exactly this point here to be in the center. Um, it doesn't. I don't know if it has a way to generate a film. As far as I know, it doesn't. Um, you just get this in the user interface by zooming in, I guess. Um, I do not understand its way of um, changing the color palette at all. Is that the in? No, that's the out coloring mode. There's the palette. There's apparently a palette editor that I don't... Um, understand uh, I'll be honest I haven't tried that hard to look at it either but just generally I'm I feel like my program still has some things to offer um, that you don't find in Xaos which is definitely weird um, but still I don't plan on advertising my program that much or working that much more on it I might look into those uh, null pointer exceptions or whatever after the stream but in general um, I'm just happy to leave this code as it is, as um, a witness, I guess, of how I wrote Java code 10 years ago, uh, which is, for instance, uh, you will notice, no tests. Uh, I didn't do testing back then, and so any change that I make now is going to be terrifying. Um, also, the code formatting is sometimes really weird, and also half the files are in Windows line endings, and half of them are in Unix file endings. I don't know how they ended up, because I'm pretty sure all the development I did there was on Windows. Um, some of the formatting can be really weird, probably nothing you can see here. Uh, oh yeah, also, there's just, if we go to the default plugin again, in here there's just several Mandrold image makers, there's the calc all, which is just dead code. There's no way to reach this code. It's just there because I didn't, uh, because I wasn't used to, um, uh, I wasn't used to Git yet. So I just kept copies of the code around. Even in the no holds one, I think there's uh, several copies. No, it's Mandelbrot passes, right? That's it's in the Sif image maker actually. There's Mandelbrot passes method. There's Mandelbrot passes not final, which is just a copy of the code, except. Except what? I'm not sure what's supposed to be different, actually. I think this might be identical. 
Right, there's the not final, there's the final one where that said real new was a final double inside the loop instead of being um, a double outside the loop. And then there's one with two paths where I think I did my own loop unrolling. Um, and I think I just tried out the different versions of this code and tried to see which one is faster. And like now I'm fairly sure that um, this kind of difference, do you have the variable in here or do you have it out here? That's the kind of thing that the JVM 100% optimizes away and there's absolutely no point in me um, trying to be clever there, I'm fairly certain. Um, but yeah, you will find different copies of some pieces of code around. Um, and yeah, the reason why is just um, that's how I did the code 10 years ago and I don't really want to change it now. Also, I seem to have triggered an eclipse bug here on the left because those line numbers are definitely not right. Um, yeah, but it is usable. Um, you can use this uh, run.sh script on Linux and compile.sh, of course. Um, if you're on Windows, I'm pretty sure this should also be doable. You can probably write a batch file that does something sim similar, but I'm not going to add that because I have no way to test it. But actually, there was, I saw earlier, there was some batch files in there. Uh, in the core sample, what does this do? Uh, oh, that's a shell script and... What? Why a shell script? Did I really use Linux already? In 2013? Possible. I'm not sure. I th Yeah, yeah, I think I might have used... No, I'm not sure. But there's a one batch file there for how to generate um, video with a maximum of two gigabytes of memory. That's cute. Um, it zoomed out fairly slowly in this case, 1.02 instead of 1.05. Um, it sent log output to a file for some reason. Um, it concatenated all the files. Right, so I'm, I was still using the X264 mode, but I was writing them into files first. And then this brings them into the correct order. Um, and then you need to change, set the right input res and everything. And then if you're lucky, then it works. Um, yeah, uh, so that's the example file that's there. I didn't realize that was there, actually. Uh, that might be more or less useful than the wiki, I don't know. Uh, what have you been writing in the chat? No tests. <laughs> it's very nice to have tests, definitely. But the current way to test this is just run the code and hope that everything still works. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think I am going to update the README a little bit because uh, Fractalizer, you can replace it with a web archive link and go to my website. This has actually been dead for many, many years, um, but there used to be, I still have the code. Uh, so there's still uh, versions 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Um, before I started using Git, those versions are still around. I have the uh, jar files at least. I don't know if I have the Java code. Um, just not on my website anymore. Um, so I'll probably just remove this. Uh, screenshots following soon. I mean, I can just add screenshots. And then planned features is just a lie. I'm not planning on doing anything anymore. What? What was I thinking? I wanted to support Buddha Broad. No, no way. Absolutely no way. <laughs> I looked at that yesterday again because someone mentioned it on Twitter and that looks like an absolute nightmare to calculate. Uh, so I'm not doing that. I do want to come to back to it at some point. This is what I wrote in 2013, I think. Uh, how old read me? Uh, yep, this is from... Oh, it was around Christmas, 2013. <laughs> that's when I added this to the read me. Okay. So that's definitely not happening. Um, so the thing with Buddha Broad... Uh, it looks really nice, um, but if I understood it correctly from reading it yesterday, it's um, 
for every one of the points that escapes the fractal uh, while calculating it and doing all these iterations and seeing the point zipping around in the complex plane you do a trace of it and then um, so each pixel here doesn't correspond each pixel still corresponds to one uh, coordinate in the complex plane but instead of you can't ask what is the color of this pixel you have to calculate the whole thing and then you see how many of the points that escaped into infinity passed through this pixel. And then depending on that, you make the pixel brighter or less bright. Um, and the problem with that is you can't really zoom in. Um, with the Mandelbrot set, it's very easy. For each pixel, you have one coordinate where you start the calculation. So you, to zoom in, you just calculate um, for that small subset. But for the Buddha Broad set, if I wanted to zoom in into this small region, the points that eventually pass through that region on their way to infinity might be anywhere here. So you have to do just as much calculation. Um, and there is not really an efficient way to support zooming in. Uh, and so I don't think I really want to be implementing that. Uh, but definitely looks nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't really have a good end to this stream, unless we just want to um, run it one more time and just make a little movie of us for ourselves. So that's, um, let's do that if you want to. Uh, do we want to make a movie of the Metal Road set or of the Julia set? Quick chat. <laughs> um, and I'll just get myself an apple in the meantime, actually. And also, I remembered I forgot to take the iron pills today that I'm supposed to take because it wasn't that high when I was donating on Thursday. So let's actually eat the iron pill first and then the apple later, I guess. Uh, Julia, okay, let's go with the Julia set. And which color palette? I think... Um, right, I didn't talk about the stretching palette yet. Uh, let's pick that. Because um, one thing about the um, normal HSP rotating palette is, let's start with this one, um, is that as you zoom in, um, the image gets more and more busy. Actually, this is a bad example for that. Um, let's come back to the Julia set in a second and first talk about the Mandelbrot set. Um, so as you zoom in, You've seen this before, the image gets very busy and ha you have to increase the number of iterations to make it look nice um, to, let's say, 512. Oops, that was not 512. Uh, there we go. And then you can see something here again. And so this would be a fairly nice frame for a film. Um, and actually, if you zoom in, you would probably want to increase it even more a bit, maybe 1024. Yeah, that's nice. But now at the start of the film, you're just going to see a sea of red. And as you zoom in, it's just going to be red and red and red and eventually turns orange and so on. So that's boring. Uh, so that's why when I came back to this after 10 years, um, just a few months ago, I added this uh, HSB stretching palette where as you zoom in, um, it the palette stretches, so to speak. So at the beginning, at the Oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, I wanted to choose the Mandelbrot set. Um, at the beginning, um, you have um, six colors, I think it's supposed to be, but that doesn't look like six. Um, but let's zoom out on center, 100%. Um, at the beginning, it uh, goes through the color wheel fairly quickly. And then in the next stage, you can see more differentiations in between red and orange and green and so on. And as you keep zooming in, oops, that is not right. Um, the color palette stretches so that it always looks more or less interesting. Um, and you can uh, tweak a little bit how much it stretches uh, between four and eight maybe. 
uh, but I found that six actually looked pretty good. So that's a palette that I wrote specifically when I noticed films don't actually look good at the normal palette. Um, so let's go back and we want to be making a Julia set zoom. And I think we want to be using the HSP stretching palette so that it looks nice as we go deeper in. And now, uh, how are we going to choose the point to zoom in on collectively? I don't know. Um, just write things in the chat, I guess, and I'll try to follow them. Um, maybe we can start, go do we go in the middle here or do we go into this one of the stars on the side or whatever? And I don't know what the stream delay is or the chat delay or whatever. That's a bit inconvenient, I guess. Mm. At the tip of one of the four key bits. Yeah, let's go to one of those parts then. Um, and zoom in a little bit on that, but not too far. And then maybe fork that again. I mean, one thing is this might not be the most interesting Julia set. Um, because this one just seems to be a lot of spindly arms stretching out, all looking very much the same um, as the start image. So maybe we should actually be going to the metal road set first, zoom in somewhere in there, find an area just in the vicinity of the metal road set, and then pick the Julia set off that. Um, yeah, let's make let's pick a more spirally area. Uh, let's see if it looks spirally around here. Mm. Hmm, maybe. Let's go back to the metal road set, but um, zoom in a little bit around there and go to one of those little metal road sets. There we go. Uh, actually, let's pick the tiny one at the tip and then go out here. There's an even tinier one. And let's pick a Julia set in the vicinity of this one. There we go. That's a nice one, isn't it? Um, and now we can zoom in. I think we can start zooming in on the center and then see what we find in there. Ooh, nice. Uh, and then maybe go out into this that looks nice and then here go out into one of these arms let's say and then into this maybe the thing is um with the mandel road set i like to end the films by just zooming into one of the black bits um until uh, it fills the entire screen, and then you're done. And the Julia set doesn't have any black bits. At least this one doesn't. Um, so you could just zoom in forever and ever, and there's no real natural ending point. Um, so I think what I used to do in those situations is just zoom in on a monochrome piece of color in the end, when it seemed like enough. So let's zoom in a bit more. Um, and then somewhere around here, let's pick this area, and that is basically just um, completely orange, and that's it. And we can save this as uh, 2202.fractxml, and then let's add edit this fact XML and say let's um, oh first of all is uh, 960 by 540 and 1920 by 1080 is that the same aspect ratio it is okay phew we don't need to worry about that so let's make this a full HD film at exactly these coordinates max passes uh, should be enough we didn't see any black bits so that's good Super sampling factor, let's crank that up to two or three. Let's say three, actually, I think. Um, the color palette we can leave as it is. 
and then um, cam args. So we run no GUI input file is 102202.fact.xml. The film is camera steady cam with a zoom of. Let's make a zoom of 0 0.01, which is a fairly quick zoom, but I don't want this to take ages either. And let's just uh, put that in 2202 in temp uh, J fractalizer 2202102. Also, the input file, uh, I didn't actually call it with J fractalizer. So, okay, that's fine. Um, And I mean, actually, let's enable the user interface uh, so we can watch it calculate. I'll just need to be careful when I move the window around that it doesn't resize the image, hopefully. But let's try this. Uh -huh. um, okay, uh, I, sh I should put a warning before I put this on the other screen. This is definitely flickering imagery, so... Um, you don't want to be looking at the screen right now as I pull this over if you uh, if you have problems with flickering images because that's actually pretty intense, this bright yellow uh, compared with the black color. Um, okay, but with that warning, let's pull it over. And we can't see everything because I don't want the image to be resized, so I'm not maximizing the window. But we should start to see structures appear in this output, I think. Um, hopefully not. No, no, you can definitely see something. Okay, there we go. Oh yeah, that is a fairly fast zoom. So we zoomed out of that yellow part. You can see, oh yeah, you can see the Im frames taking slightly longer as there was this complex part here that we saw. And now it's going faster again. It is, wow. <laughs> It is going really fast now. Wait, is that it? Are we done? Okay. How many frames did it take? 277. Okay, so FFmpeg minus... Um, uh, percent 06 D dot PNG minus O... Uh, J fractalizer 2022 webm let's say, and see how long that takes. Oh right, there's no output option. It's just this. There we go. Uh, the speed is. I think FFmpeg might almost take more time to encode it into webm than we took to calculate the whole thing, which is interesting. Um, so what did time say actually? So this was 22 and a half minutes of CPU time, but under one and a half minutes of real time, because it's very well parallelizable. Yeah, okay. No, it was faster, but not that much. So if we look at it, how does the film look like? Does it look fine? Well... Okay, we did something wrong there at the end. There was too much zoom just at the end, I think. But otherwise worked reasonably well, I think. Yeah, but almost half the film is just the last bit of zoom. That's bizarre. Okay, but also it's not supporting seeking properly, and I don't know why. Um, yeah, also we were ending on orange, not yellow. I wonder if there's... Hang on... Um, Julia... Okay, Sif Fractix Mel Loader. Max real, max min real, max real, min imag, max imag. Hang on, wait. Hang on. <laughs> uh, 
ha! I'm an idiot. <laughs> There's something missing here. A Julia set is supposed to have the coordinates C. There's one um one Julia set for every pair for every real coordinate in the Mandelbrot set or outside the Mandelbrot set. And we picked we thought we picked an interesting one. And then we threw that in the toilet because that is not in the file. And I just never realized that before because I never used the Julia set that much, but there's totally the coordinates of the C are just missing here. So what we just did was a zoom into the default Julia set of the fractal, which I guess is just at C equals zero, um, instead of the one that we had selected. And the one that we had selected is 100% gone. Unless I go through the recording of the stream and try to reconstruct where exactly I had zoomed earlier. But okay. <laughs> that's yeah and the only reason it looked interesting at least for a little bit is that we zoomed in near the middle of the image and that still happens to look interesting in the original or in the default Julia set kind of um, until we diverged from the middle at which point this Julia set unlike the one that we had been looking at um, is just a sea of yellow and that's that. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> okay, so that's what happened there. Uh, okay, so I might need to fix that as well. That is actually a fairly stupid bug, and I should fix that. But otherwise, I think um, with that failed experiment of a film, uh, we can probably say that we're done. And... Yeah, if you want, you can download this yourself. Um, if you do, please let me know. I would love to see what you're doing with it. And uh, if you want, you can even send a pull request. There are some issues, apparently. Um, I don't know if I care about any of these issues, but if you want to fix those, I don't know. Sure. Um, yeah, we created a film, and it even looks interesting for the first half of it, so that's nice. Yeah, otherwise I think I'll clean up the readme a little bit, but uh, clarify, mostly I'm happy to leave this code as it is. And But yeah, also it's still pretty nice. And I think we're one and a half hours in. That's definitely enough of this stream. I think I'll put it on YouTube and just link that in the readme as well, in case anyone wants to really desperately uh, watch that, I guess. Um, yeah, and otherwise you all can... Have a nice evening, afternoon, or whatever it is in your time zone. And I'll talk to you again at some point, hopefully. Who knows? And yeah, until then, bye.